Well, it's good to be here this morning, and uh, we trust that God is going to bless and encourage each one of us. I understand that uh, you had a problem with the lift last week. Somebody told me. Somebody got locked in the lift. Mr. and Mrs. May may at the back there, John and Elizabeth. But um, we've had it fixed now, so uh, it's good to uh, be able to welcome you all here this morning. Well, we're going to turn to God in prayer, so let's all pray. Our God and Father, as we again turn unto you this morning, we, we come to praise and to magnify you a great name. We realize the wonderful privileges that are ours in Christ. We realize that we can approach your throne of grace and call upon you and know that God is with us. Lord, we realize that you have said that you will be with your people at all times. And you are the God who has sworn that you will never forsake us or abandon us, but you are the God who constantly remains faithful to us. And so we thank you for the many blessings that are ours in Christ and for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us as we have journeyed through this pilgrimage. And so, Lord, we commit all things to you then, and we pray for Alex as he brings to us the Word of God. We pray that he might know your blessing to be upon him in spirit and uh, help him in the delivery of your Word. And so he heard us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together the first song, which is Holy, 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 and it's hymn number 47, Lord God Almighty. Well, I don't know, but uh, I remember st the first time I ever sung that hymn. It was down in Llan Madoc. The minister was uh, Bruce Powell, 
Some of you will remember Bruce, if you're old enough. And uh, I don't even know, I can't even remember the occasion when we were down there, but we had gone down to Clan Maddock uh, for the day and Bruce was there and Bruce said, oh, let's sing, he said. And I said, oh, right. So that was the song that uh, he chose for us to sing. I think he almost did a solo, but uh, it was uh, good to be in Clan Maddock uh, at that time, having fellowship. I hadn't long been a Christian, and that's going back uh, 50 years, but I was reminded then as we were singing it. Anyway, pass on to uh, notices. It's good to have uh, Alex Hunter here, uh, formerly of Cardiff, but now in Park Baptist Church in uh, that grand state of Merthyr Tidwell. Great place. I was born there, so that would be a great place, okay? After the service, we've got refreshments downstairs, and all are welcome to that. And then this evening service at 6 o'clock, Alex will again lead the service. And then Wednesday at 7 o'clock is the interactive Bible study and prayer meeting, and I'll be leading that. There's not going to be any live streaming, so you'll have to be here if you want to listen or hear or interact uh, at that time. And then next Sunday, the service is at 10, 30, and 6. Nathaniel will be preaching in the morning, and I'll be preaching in the evening, and there will be a communion service. And then just to mention as well, um, they're planning, uh, we're planning to hold another picnic in the park, uh, information is downstairs, and uh, it'll be held downstairs, obviously, if it's a rainy day, and that's in two weeks' time on Sunday, the 27th of August, so two weeks today. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Alex now. It's good to have him with us. We trust God will uh, bless and encourage you. best lectern for bigness and broadness, but like every other lectern in the land, it suffers from being too short. <laughs> Does it? Oh, wow. we we'll have to do that for tonight. It is the best then. It wins. Okay. So, just going to read a couple of brief verses from Psalm 2 speak to the younger people present, but really I'm speaking to the adults as well, um, I often find. So just some verses from Psalm 2, at the end of that psalm. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So here's a verse that's encouraging people really to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. To have him as your Lord and as your King. Now that's not unusual. But what is unusual in this psalm is it's addressed not to the ordinary people, the likes of me and you but to kings and princes and rulers. And usually when we're reading the Bible or somebody is explaining the Bible to us, we want to know, what's this got to do with me? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my life? What does this mean for my relationship with God? And so therefore, when we come to Psalm 2, we might think, well, what has this got to do with me? Because it's addressed to kings and rulers, and is telling those people to serve the Lord with fear, to make Jesus Christ their king. So what can I take away from this psalm, given that it's addressed to kings and princes and not to the likes of me and you? Well, I'm going to explain that via the way of a Disney film. Anybody here like Disney films, or is it just me? Anybody? Will it, yeah, hooray, good, okay, I'm glad. Because um, that's really important uh, for this message, that is. So, anybody here then seen the cartoon version of Disney's Mulan? Well, at least two of us, and perhaps more of us who are, there we go, some of us perhaps unwilling to admit to it. So, just in case you haven't seen the cartoon film Mulan, let me give you a little bit of what it's about. It's essentially about China, 
and China being invaded by some barbarian hordes, and every man in China, every family in China, has to supply somebody to go and fight against these barbarian hordes. Now, there's one family, and there's no sons. And so the father will have to go and fight. And the problem is, he's old and slightly crippled. And he's got a daughter, Mulan, who's terrified that her father will go to the war and be killed, and she will become fatherless. So she sort of ties her hair up like a boy, steals his armor, steals his sword, steals his horse, and off she goes to war in place of her father, which is a very brave and heroic thing to do. Now, it just so happens that she ends up saving the whole of China from the barbarian hordes, pretty much single-handedly, not quite, but almost. Now, the other problem is that along the way, she's also found out for being a female and not a male. And so, the film ends up with her before the emperor, and the emperor has an advisor, this guy called Shifu, and Shifu is disgusted at Mulan's lies, disgusted at Mulan fighting in the army when Mulan is a woman. Chifu is not really concerned that Mulan saved the whole of China. He's just concerned that, well, she's a woman. She shouldn't have been in the army. She deserves to be put to death. And so he stood next to the emperor, and Mulan is stood next to the emperor, and in the background is pretty much the whole of China looking on. Probably not, but the filmmakers make it look like that. Just crowds and crowds and crowds of people all watching on. And this is the tense moment of the film. What will the emperor say to Mulan? And this is what the emperor says. He says, I have heard a great deal about you, Mulan. You stole your father's armor. You ran away from home, impersonated a soldier, deceived your commanding officer, dishonored the Chinese army, destroyed my palace, and... You have saved us all. And the emperor makes a little bow to Far Mulan. Now, Chi Fu, who wants her dead, what does Chi Fu do when the emperor bows to Mulan? Well, he knows what to do. He gets on his hands and knees. The emperor has only given a little bow, but if the emperor has done that, I need to get on my hands and knees and bow. And then the whole of China bows to Mulan. Now, the point is this. If the emperor is bowing, you bow. And so let me bring that back to Psalm 2. God is instructing kings, princes, rulers to acknowledge Jesus Christ as they are Lord and as they are God. And if kings, rulers, princes, the great personalities and authorities in our land today are to acknowledge Jesus Christ as they are Lord and as they are King. What are we to do, do you think? Well, we also are to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as King over our lives, our Lord and our God. Well, me, God bless that portion of Psalm 2 and those thoughts to your hearts. We shall sing a song. Um, it's number 898, but it's up on the screen there as well. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so.
going to read from God's Word. Um, If you have a Bible with you and you'd like to turn with me, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 19. And just for you to know, I'm reading from the ESV version. If you've got a different version, that's absolutely fine, but I'm reading the ESV. And we're reading Matthew 19, verse 16 through to verse 13. Matthew 19, verse 16, 1, 6. If anyone struggles with my accent today, I'm sorry about that. (laughs) Um, Matthew 19, verse 16 through to 30. Let us hear God's word. And behold, a man came up to him, Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, Only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, We've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you this day for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are a loving Savior, that you came from heaven to earth to die for us when there's nothing good in us, Lord. In my flesh there is no good thing. Lord, we know what is right so very often, And in spite of knowing what is right, we do what is wrong. Lord, we disobey our own consciences and we fail to live up to the standards that we'd even set for ourselves, let alone those standards that you set for us in your word. To love God with all our heart, might, soul, strength, mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But Lord, we thank you that you've not told us, instructed us, or asked us be good enough for heaven in our own might or in our own strength by our own good works or deeds but you've simply instructed us to repent and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you've assured us Lord so many times over in the pages of scripture both by words and examples such as the thief upon the cross that when we do those things Lord you freely forgive us you not only forgive us And wipe the slate clean, but you give us your own righteousness. Lord, you've written our names in the Lamb's book of life. There's a mansion in glory allocated just to us. Lord, a mansion prepared for us. Lord, you've made us sons and daughters of the living God. Not only adopted us, and not only forgiven us and sent us on our way, but adopted us rather into your own family. You've done so many things so full of grace. And we confess, even as your people, Lord, that we don't live up to that as we ought to. 
We forget, Lord, that we're your servants and children and bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As time goes by, we, we begin to think again our life is our own and our time is our own and our gifts are our own, our energy, our money, all is our own. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live joyful lives serving you in the kingdom. And Lord, expending ourselves in the kingdom, doing the things that please you well. And rejoicing in our hearts, Lord, that we're privileged to be called your people and to share the truth of the gospel with others. Help us to do that, Lord. We feel so often that people are not interested. They do not want to hear. And perhaps many years of experiencing that dulls what perhaps was once a sharp edge, Lord, where we spoke to far more people than we do now of your loving grace. Give us opportunities, we pray. Help us to speak to others. Open up opportunities in our family, with work colleagues, with people we simply just meet in the street or on the bus stop or in the shop or wherever. But Lord, may we be about your business, even as our Savior is. Come in not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Lord, we thank you for your word. There's so much that goes under the banner of truth these days. So much that is falsely asserted, that is wrong and so antagonistic against your word. So many contradictory ideas. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the light of your word to be a lamp unto our feet. And so we pray that your word would instruct our minds and warm our hearts and move us towards yourself. Lord, it's possible there are some gathered here this morning. They know about you, but they don't know you. Lord, they, they understand parts of the Christian faith, but they've not repented, not taken Jesus Christ to be their own Lord and their own Savior. Perhaps still clinging on in some measure to the idea of being good enough for heaven. If there are any such like that here this day, we pray that you would speak powerfully to their hearts and minds. We can't do that, Lord. No volume of preaching, no cleverness of preaching, no, no entertainment that there might be in the preaching, in, in certain interesting things that are said and so forth. None of that can raise a man from spiritual death and bring him to life. But Lord, you can do that by the power of your spirit through the simple, what the Bible calls foolishness, foolish means of preaching. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take what is a simple thing, just things being explained from your word, just points being made and set forth to be considered, to be taken on board, to be taken as the word of God. And you can take that and use that to save souls and bring them into your kingdom. And so we pray that you would do that this day, that you would encourage the hearts of the saints as well, both morning as we hear the gospel afresh, and in the evening, Lord, as well, as we turn to a very different passage and consider very different things. You'd speak to all of our hearts and strengthen us in our Christian walk, strengthen us in our assurance of salvation, strengthen us in our trust that we have in you, to care for us, Lord, not just as part of a conglomerate, as part of the church, and you do love your church, but in our own individual lives and in our own difficult circumstances be glorified and praised and magnified be not with us only here but with all bible believing churches across this land and be present lord even in unbelieving churches lord where perhaps liberal terrible things will be said in in the sermon and yet even there lord where your word is read just simply read out speak powerfully through that we pray remember our brothers and sisters abroad lord who are persecuted for the faith very seriously so, Lord. Give them strength and grace to be true to you and to stand by you, Lord, even in that hour of suffering, we pray. And be with the families, Lord, of those who are persecuted and suffer for the faith and comfort them and help them to remember, Lord, even um, as we've already remembered this morning, Lord, that there's a glory to come. Lord, that this is not the end, that you will come in again and you will reign in your glorious kingdom. And those who have forsaken things for you, whether they be houses or family or even life, shall be rewarded abundantly, even above all that we could ask or think. Hear us in all these things we pray. We ask them in the name of our Saviour, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, whom be glory and honour forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another song before we gather together around God's word. Speak, I pray thee, gentle Jesus.
Let's pray just briefly. Father in heaven, we come again to you now and simply ask as we turn open the pages of Scripture and think about what these things mean and what they say to us. Be with us. Presence yourself by your Spirit. Glorify the name of your Son, we pray. Give us attentiveness of mind and heart, we pray. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've read then from Matthew chapter 19. And I'm just going to tidy up my notes so I'm not distracted looking at the wrong thing. Um, Matthew chapter 19. And really there's just one verse that I want to form as the centre of our thoughts this morning. And that's verse 20. Where the young man says to Jesus... All these I've kept, he's referring to the commandments that Jesus has quoted. All these I've kept, what do I still lack? And those words really, the second half of that verse. What do I still lack? And what I'm proposing that we do this morning is simply this. Help answer that question for this man. He's asked the question, what do I still lack? And so I want us to see the answer to that question. The words are spoken by a man who's rich. That's in verse 22. Uh, the young man heard this and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So he's a rich man. And the words are spoken by a man who's young. You'll see that in verse 20. The young man said to Jesus, all these I've kept and so forth. And if you were to turn to other gospel accounts of this same incident, you'd find that he's also a ruler. So he is a successful, young, rich man. And the context is, he's asking someone else, the Lord Jesus Christ, how he can get to heaven. And that's in verse 16. Behold, a man came to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And we would probably express that like this. How do I get to heaven? That's really what he wants to know. Now, from that question, what have I got to do to get to heaven? What have I got to do to have eternal life? I think it's fair enough to reason this, that he seems to be aware that he's not quite on his way there yet. He's also seen to have that niggle in his spirit or in his mind or in his heart from the verse that we're concentrating on. What do I still lack? So here's a man, he believes in God, he believes in heaven, but he's got this awareness that something's wrong, something's not quite right. He feels in his heart that he's not on his way there yet. And so he asks that question, what is it that I still lack? And as I said earlier, we want to seek to answer that question for him. But I think it's fair that before we come on to see what it is that he lacks, that we first have a look at the things that he's got right, the things he's not lacking, the things that are correctly in place in his life. And there are plenty of them. Let me just give you some of the things from this passage that he's not lacking in, that he's got in place, that are already correct. Now the first thing is, and this is in verse 16, he very clearly believes in heaven. He very clearly believes in eternal life. And you might think, well, no big shakes there. Surely everybody in his day believed in that. I mean, he's living in the land of Israel, full of other religious people. They, they kind of all believe in that, don't they? Not all of them, no. The Sadducees, for example, were a group of people who didn't believe in eternal life and you may recall another incident where Jesus has a run-in with them because they're trying to dismiss the whole idea. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in the afterlife. Their view is, once you've died, that's it. The here and now is all there is. There is a God and we'd like his favor in this life, but there's no afterlife. There's no heaven and there's no hell. And of course, there have always been skeptics. We, we, we tend to think of atheism as being a modern thing. But the psalmist said thousands of years ago, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Atheists have always been around. But here's a young man who believes in heaven, believes in the afterlife. And rightly so. And perhaps you're here this morning and you believe in that. And that's part of your concern. You believe in heaven. 
You believe in hell, and you want to be sure that you're going to the right place, just like this young rich ruler that we've got in the passage before us. So there's one thing he's got right. And then there's another thing that he's got right, and it's this. He didn't believe that everybody was going to heaven. And again, that's in verse 16. Behold, a man comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And surely in that question, it's implied, isn't it, that he understands that not everybody's going to heaven. And because he understands that not everybody's going to heaven, therefore he wants to know what he's got to do to be sure that he is, that he is one of the ones that is going. And again, it's also implied in the question that I want to form the hub of our thoughts this morning. What do I still lack? Not everybody's going to heaven, Lord. I believe there's a heaven. I want to make sure that I'm going there. And again, he's right in this understanding, isn't he? Uh, This is in full agreement with the way Jesus spoke of heaven and hell. Jesus said things like this. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And how many are there that find it? In Jesus' words, few. Few there be that find it. Now, there are many today, and they believe in heaven, And no doubt there were many in this young man's day and they believed in heaven. But they have this wrong understanding. Pretty much everybody is going there. I spoke to somebody just the other day who claimed to be an evangelical and yet seemed to be something of a universalist. He seemed to, if I was understanding him rightly, really poo-poo the idea of hell. Let's keep away from that because, well, God is love and pretty much everybody is going to heaven because God is love. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus taught. And it's not what this young man believed. And he was right. And maybe you have that understanding. There's a heaven. And not everybody is going there. And you want to be sure that you are one of the ones that is going there. And so far he's got these things right. And so far perhaps you have these things right. Now another thing he's got right, he's not lacking in, is he believes in the scripture in the Bible, and that's in verse 20, when he says, all these I have kept. Now, what does he say in that in response to? Well, Jesus has just been quoting the Bible to him. He's just reeling off a list of some of the commandments that we find from the Ten Commandments there in Exodus 20. And the young man's response is not, well, I don't believe in all of that. Why quote all of that to me? The young man's response is simply to say that he's, done all of that. Now, we'll come on to that as a separate point. I don't think he has done all of that. But the point is this. He accepts Jesus' quote in the Scripture. And he accepts Jesus' quote in the commandments as being authoritative and having a significant place in his life. He he takes it for granted that the Bible is the Word of God. And again, he's perfectly right in that. That is spot on. The Scripture says, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And he was right. And again, not everybody necessarily believed that. Again, there were the Sadducees who chose only to believe in certain bits of the Bible, but not other bits of the Bible. And that seems increasingly common today as well, doesn't it? You have people and they're happy to accept, say, the Gospels, but reject Paul. Uh, They like the life of Jesus, but they don't like the theology of Paul. Uh, And so you get people who do these kinds of things. But here's a young man who just, has no issue with the scripture, just accepts it and takes the Bible as being God's word. And rightly so. So there's quite a lot so far that he's not lacking. He understands heaven and he understands that heaven is restricted. And he has this grasp that the Bible is the word of God. And then also something he's kind of got right is he's a moral man. And don't worry, I'll I'll sort of explain what I mean. But where's the evidence for that? Well, again, it's in verse 20. Jesus, again, has quoted the commandments, some of them, not all of them. And the young man says to Jesus, well, all these I have kept. Now, we'll see later on the problem with that statement. But just for the time being, let's see this. That Jesus doesn't completely disparage him. Jesus doesn't turn around and and say to him what a hypocrite he is for saying a thing like that. Now, Jesus very often dealt with hypocrites very sternly and very straightly and didn't mince his words. When the Pharisees were being hypocritical in their words or behavior, uh, Jesus really 
<laughs> gave them short, sharp drift and just told them exactly what their problem was and called them things like whitewashed sepulchres, clean on the outside, full of dead mind's bones on the inside. But Jesus doesn't take that approach with this young man. This young man, he, he thinks that he's kept all of these commandments. And again, later we'll see the problem with that understanding. But Jesus doesn't say you're a terrible hypocrite for saying that. Um, he doesn't take him to task for that. Jesus seems to accept that on the outward at least, on the outward things of this man's life, he's right. He has, at least in the outward part of his life, kept these commandments. So he's a clean living man. Let's say that. Relative to other human beings, he's a moral man. He's a man who's done his best to keep the laws of God to the best of his ability. Now we'll see that's not enough. And that's part of what he does lack. But let, for the moment, let's just say this. He's a moral man. He's a clean living man. He's what we might call, not speaking now in the sight of God, but just relative to other, other human beings, a good man. You know, a, a nice kind of a man. And in so far that it goes, that's a good thing, isn't it? It's better to be moral than to be immoral. It's better to keep God's laws best we can than just to flagrantly walk all over them. And so, to some degree, here is a thing that this man has got right. Now, all of this, of course, and this is an obvious point, implies that here's another thing he's got right, that he's not lacking, that he believes in God. Believes in heaven, not everybody's going there, believes in the scriptures, believes in keeping the commandments, and it just stands to reason, doesn't it, um, that he therefore believes in God. You can't possibly believe in all those things and not believe in the almighty God. And he's right in that as well. Scripture is abundantly clear that there is one God. And this man has got that right as well. And I wonder if these things accord with you. Are you like this young man in these things? Believe in heaven, believe in hell. Not everybody's going to heaven. Trying my best to keep the commandments. Believe in God. Well, so far, so good. Here's another thing he's got going for him that he's not lacking in, and it's this, that he seeks his information or he seeks for advice in the right place. Now, many will just simply frame their own opinion of how to get to heaven or ask others around them. They don't necessarily consult the Bible, or if they do, they might apply a very sort of strange method of interpretation to it to bolster their own strange conclusions that are completely out of line with where the evangelical church is at and where the church historically has been at. There are many people who do that and come up with all kinds of odd conclusions and all kinds of weird and wonderful beliefs. This young man doesn't seem to be doing that. He wants certainty, he wants assurance, he wants to know that he's going to heaven. And what does he do about this? Well, he goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what better place, what better person could you go to than Jesus Christ himself, who is the Son of God? And so he's seeking his advice in the right place. And he's absolutely right. The Bible says of Jesus, he's the one who has the words of eternal life. He is the word of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Jesus said of himself, I came down from heaven. If you want to know the way to somewhere, you want to know the way to Merthyr, for example, you might be well advised to ask me because I just came from there this morning. And given that I've just come from there this morning, there's a reasonable chance that I'll know the way. I mean, possibly not because we all rely on Satanav so much. But, you know, given that I've come from Merthyr, I probably know the way. I might be a good person to ask. And Jesus has come down from heaven. If you want to know the way to heaven... <laughs> Well, what better person to ask than someone who's come down from heaven? Of course he knows the way. And this young man is not lacking in that. He knows who to ask. He knows who to go to. Here's another thing he's not lacking. There's loads of things he's not lacking. He's willing to learn. <laughs> There's quite a few things in this man's life that might mean that he's not willing to learn. What do we call him? We call him the rich, young ruler. And we saw very briefly at the beginning the scriptures that tell us that he's those things. 
Now, you take any one of those three things, and you might think, well, there's someone who's not going to be willing to learn. He's young. And, and forgive me, you might be a young person here this morning, and I, I hope you are, who's not like this at all. But many young people, I think as people who are older, well, you don't know anything. I mean, why would you know anything? You've only lived for decades longer than me. Like, but young people somehow, some, somehow think that old people know nothing. Uh, and we young people know everything. I remember when I was a teenager, my best friend's mother had a fridge magnet and it said something like, move out, get a job, pay the bills, do everything yourself while you still know everything. I thought that was brilliant. Uh, that kind of expresses so well, doesn't it, how some young people can approach life in these matters. Well, he is a young man and he's not like that. He's willing to ask and he's willing to learn. But then on top of his youth, he's rich. And again, just being rich can create this sense of self-dependence, can't it? I don't need anything from anybody else. I'm rich. I don't depend on anybody else for everything. I, I supply all my own needs. And rich people can be very proud as a result of that. Not always, but sometimes. But here's a man who's both young and rich, and he's still willing to ask. He's still willing to learn. <laughs> and there's a third thing against him being able to just be willing to learn, and it's this, he's a ruler. I mean, can you imagine, you're young, and you're super wealthy, and you rule over other people, and everyone in the community respects you, and yet you're still willing to learn, you're still willing to ask. This is really commendable, isn't it? This is something he's not lacking, this is something he's got in place. And I wonder where you stand this morning with regard to these matters. Are you proud, young, knowledgeable, rich, well-respected, and therefore you're not willing to listen, you're not willing to learn from a preacher you've never seen or heard before, from the Word of God, just simply being explained and opening his pages and, and seeking out what God says. Are you willing to learn from the Word of God? Well, this young man is, and he's commendable in that, and that's something he's not lacking. So there's all these things going for him. <laughs> he's got all this stuff that is not lacking. It's all in place. Belief in God, belief in the Bible, belief in heaven, understanding that heaven is to some degree an exclusive place. Not everybody goes there. He's willing to learn. He's willing to listen. And so if he asked us the question, what do I still lack? We might say, what are you talking about, young man? You know, you're a great young guy. and You've got the right beliefs. You're looking in the right places. You carry on as you are. Jesus doesn't deal with him like that. Jesus recognizes his question as being a valid one. This young man has this nagging doubt in his heart that there's something in spite of everything that's going for him, there's something that's not quite right. There is something that's lacking. There is a heaven, but I'm not certain that I'm going there. And I need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ about that. And Jesus doesn't send him on his merry way, saying, of course, you're perfectly fine, and of course, you're going to heaven, you're a decent young guy, you carry on. Jesus acknowledges that this young man is lacking in certain areas. And so what is it that he's lacking? Well, for all that he's got in place, there's quite a few things that are lacking, actually. Now, number one, he lacks assurance. He's not certain of going to heaven. Hence his whole question. Hence his seeking out of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he has no assurance at all. It's heaven, I know it's there. But I'm not convinced that I'm going there. And is that you this morning? Do you know there's a God? Do you know there's a heaven? Do you know there's a hell? But there's this nagging doubt in your heart. I'm not sure where I'm going. Now, do you know under Christianity alone, under the gospel alone, can you know that you're going to heaven? You can't do that under any other religion. And the reason is this, every other religion is based on being good enough. It's like the whole of life is an exam. And you don't get your grade or your mark until it's all over. And therefore, until it's all over, you don't actually know whether you're going to heaven or hell. But Christianity, the gospel, is not based on that. It's not based on works. It doesn't make life into an exam. It's very, very different. And we'll come to see that as we move on. And that's part of this young man's problem. 
He's seeing life as an exam, a test that he needs to take. And that's why he can't be certain that he's going to heaven. And that brings us on to the second thing that he's lacking. He lacks an understanding about how to get to heaven. You see, his religion is a religion of works. You can almost hear it in his initial question. Now, teacher, listen, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? It's not an entirely open question. This question could be more open. But what needs to happen for someone to go to heaven? But, but he's built an assumption into his question. What, there's got to be some good thing, some exquisitely moral good thing that I can do that will assure me heaven. What is it? It's a loaded question. And because it's built on an assumption that entry into heaven is based on what I do, on what I am, on who I am. And he's lacking in that. In, in that aspect, he is completely and utterly wrong. The Bible says, by the deeds of the law, nobody will be justified in God's sight. You don't get justified, you don't get right with God by doing good things. It doesn't work like that. But this man lacks that understanding. Now, another thing he lacks is this. He understands that the way to heaven is restricted. We saw that. Not everybody's going there. This young man, he gets that. But I don't think he understands just how restricted heaven is. You see, Jesus says in verse 24, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Here's your needle, there's the eye. When I was a little boy and I wanted to help my mum, I'd always struggle to get the cotton thread through the eye of the needle. But Jesus says it's easier to get a camel through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And then in verse 26, he, he just calls it out more plainly. He says it's impossible because the disciples are surprised. Well, who can get to heaven then? Who can be saved? Jesus says, with man, it is what? It is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But here's a rich young ruler who thinks, well, surely it is possible for me to do something good enough to get myself into heaven. Please just tell me what it is. No, 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 no. You're wrong. You're lacking a proper understanding there. Heaven is restricted. But it's restricted to the degree where it is impossible for you in your own strength to get in. That is how restricted heaven truly is. Why? Because the standard for entry into heaven, if you want to try and get there by being good enough, is not just being a nice person, not just being respectable, not being a little bit cleaner and better than others, but utterly and completely and wholly perfect. That is the standard. If you want to get there by the same way that this man was to get there, namely by just being a good person, by being moral and by keeping God's law. And that brings us to the next point. He lacked a proper understanding of the purpose of the law. You see, he's brought up to believe the Bible. He's brought up to be moral. He's brought up to understand the Ten Commandments. And he's such a nice young guy that he doesn't rebel against that he tries his best to live in that and to keep that and to do those things that he's been taught and I for one would never criticize him for that as I said earlier it's better to be moral I think than to be immoral good on him for trying but he lacks a proper understanding of the purpose of the law what he thinks is this that the law is there for me to keep it, and in keeping it, demonstrate to God that I'm the kind of guy that God should have in heaven. That's what the law is there for. That's not what the law is there for. The Bible says that the law is there for a very different reason. It is a strict schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. In other words, what the law does is this. It doesn't pat us on the back and say, oh, well done, you kept ten laws today. That's getting you on your way to heaven. Instead, what it does is this. When you slip up, it goes, sinner! That's what it does. It condemns us. It troubles us. It points out our errors. It points out not just things we do wrong on the outside, but things that go wrong in our hearts on the inside. 
and in our minds and in our thoughts and in everything we are. It doesn't pat us on the back. It condemns us. But it doesn't condemn us as an end in itself. It condemns us and then points to Christ. It says, sinner, you can't be saved by keeping me the law. It's impossible. You need Jesus Christ. That's the function of the law. That's what the law does. But this young man, he doesn't get it. He thinks, well, the law is there for me to keep it. And when I've kept it all, I'll, I'll kind of be good enough for heaven. But that's what's creating these nagging doubts in him. I, I know what I'm still lacking. I don't feel like I've kept all the law properly. Well, I, I kind of feel like I have, but I'm not sure. There's something wrong. How can I get to heaven? You notice how Jesus deals with him. I think this is quite wonderful, really. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus points out, not all of the laws, but some of the laws he knows this young man will be comfortable with. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. In other words, don't lie. Honor your father or mother. Done all that, says the young man. Now that's quite a claim, really, given that Jesus included in his list, love your neighbor as yourself young man, even though that's in the list, still says, done all of that? Really? <laughs> Anybody here claim that they've loved their labor just as well as they've loved themselves? Or if we're more honest, don't we really believe in our hearts? If we're honest with ourselves, I love myself more than I love my neighbor. I don't love my neighbor as well as myself, not, not in the slightest. No chance. I haven't done that. But this young man, he's happy enough to say, yeah, I've done that. I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen. Of course I love my neighbor as myself. But he's wrong. And Jesus has a wonderful way of pointing out to him that he's wrong. And even though he thinks he's kept all of these things, ultimately he has a lack of ability to obey God's law. He has a lack of ability to obey God's law. How does Jesus point that out to him? Well, Jesus issues a challenge. He says, well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> if you really have loved your neighbor as yourself, off you go, sell everything you've got, give all the proceeds to the poor, come and follow me. Now, some people misinterpret that. Some people think that Jesus really is saying, if you go away and do those things, then you'll be saved. You'll become a Christian in that way. Not at all. What Jesus is doing, is putting his finger on this young man's problem. This young man thinks he can be good enough in his own strength to get to heaven, and he's really rather good at keeping God's law. Well, off you go then, says Jesus. Let's see you go and do that. Go and sell everything you've got. Give all the proceeds to the poor. Come and follow me, and then we'll all see that you're good enough to get to heaven. He can't do it. <laughs> he can't bring himself to do it. And he finds out the hard way that what he's lacking is an ability to keep God's law. It's kind of what he wants. I want the ability to keep all of God's law. But what he finds out through Jesus interacting with him is this. He can't do it. Is that you? Have you ever found out the hard way that you actually lack the ability to keep God's law? If you've never found that out, it might be because you lack something else that this young man was lacking. And it's this, the spiritual depths of the law. You see, this young man, he comes across a commandment like, don't commit murder. Or another commandment like, don't commit adultery. And his very simple brain process, no doubt, goes like this. But I've never plunged a knife into anybody's heart. And I've never literally committed adultery against my wife if he's got one or with somebody else's wife, let's say, if he's unmarried. And so I'm not guilty of breaking those commandments. That's his very simplistic understanding of the law. But it doesn't work like that. And Jesus Christ explains the way that it does work in his Sermon on the Mount. And the actual way that it works is like this. That you don't need to actually do those things to be guilty of them. You don't have to go and stab someone to death or shoot someone to death or poison someone to death or whatever them to death, to be guilty of murder. All you need to do is be angry against them in your heart, or hate them, or wish bad things upon them. And similarly, you don't have to actually sleep in the same bed 
as somebody else to be guilty of committing adultery with them. All you need to do is lust after them in your heart. And you're already guilty of breaking the commandments. That's the way Jesus, and you can read it for yourself there back in Matthew 5 later on if you want. That's the way Jesus interprets the commandments. And when you see them like that, it hopefully becomes more obvious. I don't have the ability to keep those. I can't do it. Not like that. Not to that depth. Not to that standard. And Jesus is revealing to this young man, he's not what he thinks he is. He's a good young man. In terms of comparison with other human beings. But he's not good enough for God. He's not good enough for heaven. And he's failing that standard. And perhaps that's you. Good person, moral person, likable guy, lovely woman. Everybody gets on with you. But you're not good enough for God, friend. You don't meet the standard of his law. Another thing he lacked was a true understanding of God and a true understanding of Jesus Christ. You see, he's willing to learn from the Lord Jesus, so he must have esteemed him in some way. He calls him good master, and, and, and that's really nice. That's good. That's better than others, let's say, who denied Jesus and even had him crucified. But perhaps if he realized the Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God, who had come down from heaven, then he'd have had cause to think more deeply. Let me try and explain what I'm getting at. If we can get to heaven by keeping God's law and being good and nice and all of that, what's the purpose of Jesus coming down from heaven to earth? He sent prophets in the Old Testament to explain the moral law. Moses has already done that. It's already been built upon by others of the prophets, like Isaiah and Ezekiel and so forth. If we can get to heaven by keeping God's law and being good enough, there's no reason for the Son of God himself to come down from heaven. None. Why did Jesus, the Son of God, come down from heaven to earth? And the answer is, not just to give us more laws, or explain the laws of the Old Testament more clearly, but to die for our sin, to be crucified upon the cross, the just for the unjust, that we might be brought to God. The reason for Jesus' coming is this, that you and I deserve punishment because we've broken God's law. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, comes to die on the cross, taking that punishment that we deserve in our place. So that we get to heaven like this. Lord Jesus Christ, I am a vile sinner. I have broken your laws and failed to keep your commandments. I have not loved God with all my heart, might and soul. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I've never committed murder with a knife, but I've done it in my heart, Lord. I've never committed adultery outright, but Lord, I've done that in my heart so many times. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because you have died upon Calvary's cross for sinners like me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And then you're lacking nothing. You see, this young man lacks certainty. He lacks assurance. Because ultimately what he lacks is an understanding of the gospel. If you could put it in a nutshell, what's your problem, young man? What do you lack? An understanding of the gospel. You think you're getting to heaven by works, but you're not. If it worked that way, why would Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come from heaven to earth? He wouldn't. But it works this way. That God sends his Son as a substitute for sinners to die upon the cross in order that we might be saved. As simple as that. But he doesn't get it. I believe he would come to get it. Because if you read the parallel passages elsewhere, it says that Jesus loved him. And I'm sure that this was the first stage of his conversion. Jesus is just dealing with him and showing him, you're not quite as good as you think you are, young man. And once he's learned that, Jesus Christ will lay the work in his heart to bring him to faith and salvation through Christ. And so maybe this is you this morning. And you've got this same question as he has. And I wonder if there's emphasis on the word still. 
we don't know the emphasis, do we? we? We don't exactly know how he asked his question. What do I still lack? What do I still lack? But I think it might have been this. What do I still lack? All these years, Lord, of being religious. All these years of trying. All these years of doing my best. And yet, this still constant nagging, enduring feeling that somehow I'm not quite on my way there. And is that your question this morning? What do I still lack? All of these years of coming to church. All of these years of listening to sermons. All of these years of reading the Bible. All of these years of singing hymns. And yet, Lord, I'm still lacking something. What is it? What is it simply this, friend? You've simply never repented and turned to Jesus Christ in faith. You're somehow still leaning on your own perceived goodness, hoping to get to heaven by being good enough. And through all of that, you've got this nagging knowledge, really, that it's not getting you to heaven. And it's not. But Jesus Christ will. Repent, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came from heaven to earth to die for us, to love him, to love us, to give his life a ransom for us. Lord, there's no other way to be saved. There never has been. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by you. Help us to know that, Lord. Help us to be certain in that. Help each one of us to be certain that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and to be certain that heaven is ours because we have that faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, there may be those of your people here and they lack assurance, not because they're not Christians, not because they're trusted in works, because they aren't, but just for some other reason. Lord, I pray that you would bless those people, you would pour out your Spirit abundantly upon them, and that you would help them to realize, Lord, that they have trusted in you, and they do trust in you, and they are safe in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, hear us in all these things, we pray, for his name's sake. Amen. We will sing a final hymn. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.